that <laughs> I cannot believe what I'm about to say. I cannot believe. Look, if anyone seen my gut report, check it out. I may leave a link below in the comments, but. I wasn't sure if I was going to do an NXT review because of what happened on Raw and that the acquisition has gone through. Endeavor is currently the owner of WWE and UFC and Vince McMahon is the chairman and he's also in creative and we know he booked the show. We know this. He made three script revisions before the show started. The show was trash. Everyone is angry at Triple H when they shouldn't be. Because Triple H didn't book the show. But, you've seen the title. <laughs> I cannot believe I could say this. NXT was better than Raw hands down. Guys, I'm not even telling you NXT this episode was great. Was awesome. I'm not. NXT who I do still believe is still run by Shawn Michaels. Who as I said. Takes a little bit of Vince McMahon. 1980's to 1990's booking. And Triple H's original NXT booking. Smushed them together. And created what we have right now. It is a show that is consistent. That at least tries to make things interesting. In this show, we got two new people coming in. We got surprises. We literally got a screen ending, unlike the one from Raw, that actually makes sense. I'm telling you, this show, hands down, was vastly better than Raw. <laughs> And I know people are going to say, dude, you are nuts. NXT is not a good show. It sucks. I'm not telling you it's perfect. As I've always said, I've never, I never glazed over anything about NXT. I've never said it was good. I said it was okay in many cases. The way Sean has generally booked it has been okay. I've never said it was better than Triple H's work. Either the original NXT or the current version before Vince, we know for months, well, most people knew for months, was booking. Because you notice a change from Triple H's booking somewhere around December into January till now. Easily could have even been a little early than that. But I say around December is when Vince was already heard to already shown up on the show till now. So... Let's get into it. The person who opened was Indy Hartwell. Now, I'm not going to tell you Indy's one of the best people there. She's not. She really needs more work. But the way they booked her for more than four months or five months, she was ready for a change and she needed to win. She was one of the few people that had been booked in a way that could win the championship and needed to. And they finally put it on her. But I will say this. At Standard Deliver, I did not agree on Dexter Loomis being the one to help her up the ladder. I'm sorry. I don't agree with it. She should have done it on her own merits and have a win that no one could question. She had to have Dexter Loomis get between her damn crotch, which many men and women want to be. I'll be ten of them. <laughs> to help her up the ladder. I'm just saying she deserved better. She should have had that moment without help. But I'm not taking anything from it. The thing that I kind of wish had happened during the promo was she would acknowledge Booker T at ringside. Because, yeah, you didn't get a lot from Roxanne Perez. She couldn't just say, I want to thank Booker T for beginning my, my career. Because he basically trained her from scratch. She started with him. And Indy Hartwell has gone through many different promotions. So I'm not expecting her to do that. No. She's gone through many promotions. But the last promotion she went to before WWE's NXT was Reality Wrestling. He promotes that as a developmental before the developmental. That's when it comes with Booger T. He gets a lot of people that's in Reality Wrestling, including Athena, to get onto NXT TV. What do you think Athena came in? 
What do you think Roxanne Perez, Indy Hartwell, and a few others that were seeing on reality wrestling, they started in Booker T's promotion, and when he believed they were good enough, he would offer them to WWE to at least evaluate them. So I kind of wish, in my point of view, that she did acknowledge him because Roxanne did not. She didn't. But that's just me. But guess who comes out? Zoe Starks to basically say that Indy is not even close to the great people of Bailey, Sasha, um, you know, you know, you know, you know, Charlotte Flair, and several others, including the wonderful, well, Bailey, I did hear Bailey and Oscar are pissed. I want to say I'm probably going to make a gump report on them. I did for, I did. Taking out NXT for a second. I filmed a Triple H video. I am thinking of doing the video about the comments from Oscar and Bailey. I don't know when I'm going to do it, but I'm probably going to see if I can do it this week. But she mentioned them. Not by name, but just being the legends that will be, well, people who will eventually be legends. And she says, instead of you being up here, you're down here, you're nobody. But you know what? Instead of giving Roxanne Perez a shot because before a Zoe came out, she was saying, Roxanne, I want to respect you. I wouldn't have had this because of you. You know what? You be the first person because actually, I think that would be a very special thing. Seeing that the two girls from Reality of Wrestling, Booker T's girls, are actually going to be facing each other for the title. I would love it that they actually were in front of him in an interview where both of them literally say, we love you, Booger T. You got us where we are. I know he doesn't need to accolade, but it does help with their story because Roxanne truly started in reality wrestling. And Indy came from other places and went to reality wrestling as a last stop. I kind of wish they would tie that in and kind of really give Booger T's promotion, a little well, developmental promotion, a little bit of rub because they need it. But anyway... We got that. It wasn't bad. It wasn't perfect the way Indy talked. It wasn't perfect that Ro well, Roxanne didn't come out. She's now gone dark. But Zoe didn't talk too bad. Indy didn't talk too bad. I'll give it to you that. It was okay. It's not the same as what happened with Roman Reigns with Cody Rhodes and Paul Heyman on Monday. But it was okay for what it was. We got a match between Pretty Deadly and the family the, 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 the Don with the underboss. Now, this was going along with Stand and Deliver because Pretty, pretty Deadly, who were the hosts, I didn't really mention much about them. They hosted okay. But they pissed them off by being disrespectful to them after they lost their match. And that's what sparked this, which goes along, which is not bad. That at least is continuity Going from the pay-per-view into the next show that will springboard to the rest of the year. Pretty much consistency, as I've said. We know there was no way Pretty Deadly was going to win unless they cheated. And that's what happened. Pretty Deadly cheated by mixing up each other because one of them was caught. I can't remember who was. And the other one grabbed the turnbuckle off the top Top turnbuckle ripped it off, did a little bit of finagling. Tony D'Angelo bumps his head and gets pinned that way. And now they're going to have a few going forward, which will give Pretty Deadly something to do and the underboss and the Don something to do, which is fine. It's good to see they're at least starting something. And hopefully, like, when it came to Tony D'Angelo's going up against, um, sense, um, going up against, Escobar. That story was a good story. It wasn't a perfect story, but it was a good story. I'm not saying you get that out of Pretty Deadly, but you will get something, I hope. They will build it slowly but surely, using outside sources to make it interesting. Let's move on. Jack goes against Odyssey Jones. Now, we had last week a battle royal that was going to give a person a chance to get something. And that was Axiom, which is I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But it was Dijak who pulled out Odyssey Jones due to the fact that Odyssey got rid of him. So this was leading into this match, which is fine. Continuity. 
and hopefully they will do this longer than maybe one match. Maybe they'll do several matches where they'll start doing promos at each other and you'll get more more build up until they get to the next pay-per-view. It was maybe about two or three, maybe four minutes and Dijak won clean. I'm not surprised. There was no way it was going to do that, but I'm kind of hoping it will continue. I'm hoping that due to the fact Dijak beat him, the Odyssey will be frustrated and Dijak will rub it into his face and they will continue it for a little while. So both of them will have something to do and hopefully they'll show on NXT TV. I'm just saying. Um, Frazier versus Dragon Lee. Now, No Mandar, I had seen him once. Once, a long time ago. I think once on, I think I tuned into NXT UK once with him on it, I think. And that was before the Heritage Cup. Because he won it before NXT UK shut down. So, when it comes to this, and I don't think NXT Europe is going to happen now. Due to Vince taking control again. I don't know. But, as they're about to have their match, Norman Dar comes out from the crowd with the damn Heritage Cup. And he says on the mic, I am Norman Dar. And I see both of you. You look good. Both of you look great. But... You're no match for Nomendar, who won the Heritage Cup, who is now the first and most greatest acquisition of NXT. I am now here, and maybe I might give one of you an opportunity at my cup. So show me what you got. And we get the match, which was the second best match of the night for me personally. Not taking anything away from Frazier or Dragon Lee. Do I believe Dragon Lee is a great wrestler? He's a great luchador. I can say he's by the standard of 1 to 10. I say it's a great luchador. Hmm. I say at least a 7 or an 8 as a great luchador. Is he better than Axiom? Because he's basically a luchador as well, I believe. Don't know yet. They got to face each other one on one before I can really do a really good assessment. But him going against Frazier... They had some good chemistry, but there were still some hiccups during that match. It was slightly sloppy. And I don't know who it was. Was it Frazier or was it Dragon Lee? Mainly due to that non-familiar... They weren't familiar with each other that much. Unless they haven't done it in such a long time, they forgot. You could tell they were a little off on some of the moves they were doing. But at least it didn't look choreographed. I will give it that. I liked it. In that respect, that when you do a high-flying match with people like that... The major issue is that they got to do the setups. And they got to do it just right. So they take more than a few seconds to do it. And that is one of the major problems of high-flying wrestling. You got to do the setup correctly. Or you will hurt yourself or you will hurt your opponent. Or just as bad, make everything look staged. So they were a little off. But I will say they were very close in their setups. And not taking too long. In the end, Dragon Lee won, but the question is, is he going up in No Man Dar? And that's if I even remember No Man Dar's name, because I may just forget about No Man Dar, counting on how many more videos he's going to do. Oh my gosh. Someone told me in my, in my Gump report, because I put it up, that I actually nailed everything I said that might happen. I actually said it a long time ago. It's been nine months. I don't even remember. I've done how many videos in the last nine months? What, uh, maybe... What, 75, 100 easily more? I don't even know how many episodes I've done of regular and Gump Report and anything in between with the pay-per-views. I don't even remember saying I nailed it. I, being, I, You know what I mean. Now, let's do some of these segments in the back. JC James does a video package talking about nailing Gigi Golan. Good, fine. They had to continue it. I didn't think it was going to be over. And she's the one who basically screwed up the option of Gigi winning. I'm not surprised. I'm glad they did it because it does go along with the story. When you see the vid pack of... Hmm. Let me give it to you like this. When it comes to Fallon, Briggs, Jensen, and Keanu James, I've not been 100% fond of it because it hasn't been really always joked correctly for me personally but in the last couple of weeks I will say at least it was consistent 
and it made sense, even though I wasn't really 100% feeling it, because some of these matches were only driven for that story. And sometimes it works perfectly fine, and sometimes it does not. And when it came to stand and deliver, it, it really felt janky-ish. But this segment, where basically Kiana, she told Jensen, look, I, I'm angry at you for what you did. This is your fault we lost. And Briggs and, and, and Fallon trying to say, no, why are you blaming him when it's your fault trying to cheat? And Fallon said, you cheated on Jensen. And Jensen said, you did? He said, what? We never had an agreement. This is exclusive. You never said it. But I will admit, when I kissed you, it was different. But after you didn't come to my aid, I'm done. She walks away. And both of them trying to consult Jensen, but... He made it very clear, stop it. I'm going to go after her still. Do not get in my way. And he walks off. So the story's not over, but the question's going to be, since Briggs and Jensen are a good tag team, are they trying to put a wedge between the two to see how Briggs can work without Jensen or Jensen can work without Briggs or better yet, to see if Kiana James can do something with Jensen by himself. Because there's a good chance if he breaks away from Fallon and Briggs, he's going to need this. So there is a possible fork in the road with this story. I'm not saying that's great storytelling, but it's not something that hasn't been done before. So, comparing this to Raw, let's be honest. This is better than Raw. Now, Duke wanting to... Well, we got Chase University and Andre Chase praising Tyler Bates. But then Duke getting upset because he's not praised because he got the win. And now he's going to have a celebration that's going to make him feel important. And I'm just going, when are they going to actually break him off to try and start his own university? Or maybe try and oust Andre Chase. Andre Chase from the university. I'm wondering if they're going to go there with that eventually. That's a big question. Um, let's see. Oh, I got to say this now. <sighs> Unfortunately, this is upsetting. If anyone's ever seen the Bushwhackers, they were some of the most funniest people you can go, yeah! I'm sorry. I'm a Bushwhacker fan. I always was. I love Butch. I love Luke. I, I love, love them both. I always loved them. But unfortunately, Butch died. He's passed away. We don't know what caused it. We just know he's passed away. Now, maybe they'll do a autopsy and they'll release the information. But at this point, we don't know why he passed away. We just know he's, he's passed. And the daughter of, his, of the surviving Bushwhacker was the one who announced it to WWE and to the rest of the world that unfortunately he's passed away. He, oh, they were a treasure, man. If you didn't like the Bushwhackers, I can understand. They were very hokey. Kind of like Coco Beware. Kind of like the Junkyard Dog. But they have their places. And they knew where they deserved to be. I loved them. And now it kind of hurts my heart that one of them is gone. I'm just saying. And um, what do I want to say about... Dragonoff versus Von Wagner next week. Simple. Stone will leave Von Wagner if he loses. The question is going to be, are they going to be willing to sacrifice Dragonoff to Von Wagner or not? To be honest, I'd rather see Von Wagner lose and see Mr. Stone work with Dragonoff and see what they do with him there. Because I'm telling you, and I've always said this, when it came to the UK, ver UK version of NXT, they booked them great, from what I understand. I didn't watch it much at all. But here in NXT, a huge chunk of all the UK wrestlers have not gotten anywhere. It's very rare to see them get anywhere. I want to see them get somewhere. So if you got to stick pretty much Dragunov with a D Mr. Stone, I wouldn't mind doing that. Now, the, um, hmm, the NXT Women's Championship title match of Indy Hartwell and Zoe Starks. 
Was it a good match? No. I'm not going to lie to you. It was not one of the better matches of this show. It felt slow, which made it look kind of like choreographed or like um, telegraphed on what they were going to do for most of that match. The beginning was, it felt telegraphed. The middle felt a little better, and at the end, it was better enough that you wouldn't see it anymore. Indy and Indy won. I am not surprised. There was no way that Indy Hartwell was going to get rolled up by Zoe Starks, get nailed by Zoe Starks, and that would be the end of it. That would have been the shortest reign in history, and that would have shown Vince was there. But no, Indy won, which is fine. And in the end, as she's holding her title up, you get Tiffany Stratton coming out, which that made sense because T Tiffany wants to make clear that she's coming for that damn title. At least until Corey J came out of nowhere with a couple of new, I believe a new tat or two, because she's been away for a couple, about maybe a month or so. I believe a month, maybe two, I think. Can't remember. She came in, nailed her, lifted her title, then food on her and face Stratton saying that damn title's mine, bitch. She didn't say bitch, but that's what she meant. So you will be seeing Indy dealing with Tiffany and Cora J. Before, but well, after, I believe Roxanne Perez comes back. And Roxanne might, if I'm correct, might team up with Indy before they have the match when it comes to Tiffany and Cora J. I do believe that's going to happen. Is that, uh, is that something I want to see? No. But it is something that's understood that the reality of wrestling girls are going to work together before they actually have their match. And after the match is over, then you'll probably see Tiffany and Corey J go after that title, whether it's with Roxanne, which I don't think Roxanne should get it back, or Tiffany. I'm just saying. Ivy Nile versus Paxton. Now, this is three weeks old, guys. There was no build, no story. No Paxton coming back attacking, attacking Ivy Nile. Nothing about Paxton getting attacked by Ivy. This is cold, flat out cold. But at least they made it very clear that they are finishing up a story that probably could not fit into the entire schedule leading up into Stand and Deliver. They just want to get it over with and show continuity. Something that Vince will not. Unless it's Roman Reigns in the bloodline. I'm just saying. I really do believe that's going to be the very rare thing that's going to make sense next to Cody getting his ass whooped by Barack Lesnar. This made sense even though it is cold. The match was very choppy. I think it's due to the fact they have not been around each other. And pretty much, I think it was Paxley that was more choppy than Niles. But Niles was not great. She kind of fell back into an MMA type of style which was a bit sloppy, but Paxley looked worse. In the end, Paxley lost. Not surprised. All right. The best match of the night. Axiom versus Wesley. And I can tell you this. If you really liked the Fatal Five, what was it, five-way open challenge, this was a take on it. And as I said... On my stand liver, it felt like an X Division match. That's how that match felt. This one didn't feel like an X Division match. It felt like an NXT match. Doesn't mean the match was bad. It was the best match. It felt good. It was balanced most of the time. But you could tell both those guys were still kind of tired from what happened in Stand and Deliver. It was a rough match. I'm, I'm telling you, that was a rough match those guys went through. And you could see they were still pretty tired from it. But they did manage to put on a good showing where Axiom got his butt kicked. He lost. And there's nothing wrong with that. The only question is, where did they go with Axiom? This is where the other surprise came in. Out of three. First, no Mendar. Now this. Scripps gets on the horn, starts saying, I know who you are, Axiom. I know what you are, and I'm going to get you for that. Well, not get you for this, but get food to you, how you're nothing. And as he jumps off the top turnbuckle, Axiom super kicks him to hell. And he says he's going to reveal who he is. I do believe it's ACH. I could be wrong. 
I still think I'm wrong. But if it's ACH who's doing that, that would make some sense. I do believe it might be ACH because that's the type of style ACH would have. He has the same type of build as ACH. It just feels like it could be him. That's just me. You guys tell me below. Finally, the final segment of the show. We get him, the him celebration, or the Carmelo celebration, with his hype man, where they basically turn face. Let's, let's make this clear. The way they acted the stand and deliver, even though, even though, you see Trick messing up the match, yes, which kind of leads into what happens here, which will explain why I say this was better than Brock Lesnar and Cody Rhodes. You see that Carmelo Hayes has turned face. He has. No problem. You could tell he turned face because he tried to explain what took so long. Yes, it was hype. It was is outlandishly hyped by by trick. I mean, that's just trick. But by the end of that segment where he called out Braun Breaker to thank him for what he did, the respect he gained, and Trick Williams not trying to go at him, not trying to brag, not trying to show off, but show respect also to Braun Breaker, it's obvious that both of them have turned face. Do I want to see Trick with Carmelo as a face? In this situation, I don't know if it'll work or not. It might. You, you don't know. You don't know how things work out when you do change someone from one baby face to a heel or heel to a baby face. In this situation, you have Braun Breaker basically being respectful, saying that I was taught by Tommaso Ciampa that when you, when your time's up, you show respect to this brand and to the fans and that title and you give the respect to guy that you know is the next one after you. That's why I did it. And Carmelo respected him. And as he's trying to walk out, he says, wait, wait, wait. He wants to shake his hand. He shook it. They took a hug. Carmelo got his hand raised and I knew I knew something was about to happen. I said, who's going to hit? Who's hitting? Who is going to hit? And it is Braun Breaker. And I had this feeling that Braun Breaker would do it. Because look what happened. He legitimately has a gripe that Trick Williams screwed the match twice. Twice he screwed up the match. So he has the right to get pissed off. And in this situation, he has the right to turn heel. He has that right. And that's the reason why he's turned heel. Compared to Brock Lesnar that has no reason to turn heel because what happened? He went up against Omas. He was a face. And clearly when he had the option to come out to Cody Rhodes, he was a face. Why would he attack Cody? And particularly when they started bleeping his, his talk out where you don't know what he said, he made no sense turning heel. None. Turning into a beast. None turning against Cody. Here, Braun Breaker had the reason to turn against Carmelo and turn possibly and should turn heel because Trick Williams screwed him over twice. And Carmelo Hayes is trying to glaze over it saying that this was something special between us. This is something special. And now he's acting like the good guy when Trick is the one who screwed everything up. But he's accepting it like nothing happened. He has the right to get pissed off and turn heel. So this is what we got in this show. Was it incredible TV? Was it? I'm not going to tell you that Ivy now and, and, pa and Paxley need to be on the show. They didn't because it was three month, three, not three month, three week old cold feud with nothing in between. When it came to Dijak and Odyssey Jones, it would have been better if they just built up into it before they had the match, but they just let them have the match, I guess, to end it because they just wanted to do continuity for what happened, unless they are going to continue it. When you see what's going to happen with Chase U, it's going to be a mess, but hopefully a good mess. You wonder if Dragunov is going to get a manager when it comes to Von Wagner. We got Norman Dar that may just work with... with, with, with well, with Dragon Lee, I don't know. But you tell me, what do you think? And I'm just like, 
Guys, I cannot believe 100% that I am saying openly that NXT 2.0 is better than Raw. Flat out. This made my as as I'm preparing, like when I'm setting up my camera, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna put you for the process. Since I just did my 30 minutes and the camera is now clicked over. This is the way it was. After the show was over, I'm going like, oh my gosh. As I'm writing my notes, as you always see, I got some. And as I'm thinking about it, and I'm going in my room to set up my camera, I'm going like, am I really going to do this? Am I really going to say that NXT 2.0 or 2.1 if you want to do with the changeover with now um, Shawn Michaels controlling the show and doing the creative aspects of it if it's just him? Because I do believe that he is generally booking it, generally almost all by himself next to his own team and hopefully no Bruce Pritchard is really interfering with it. Am I really going to say NXT is legitimately better than Raw and possibly the SmackDown? Because we have no idea. Guys, let me walk you through the process here. We have two shows this week. We got Raw. We got SmackDown. This is going to be a SmackDown after WrestleMania. This is a show that you got the bloodline generally on. Do you actually believe that this show is going to be good? If Raw was that messed up this Monday, I am not going to be surprised. And we're going to hear reports that not one time they ripped up the scripts and redid it. I bet you it's going to be two or three times. I'm, I'm certain that Vince is going to rip up scripts and rewrite the show as it's going on. It is going to be a mess. And... If I am going to do my double feature of doing Rampage and SmackDown, I got to say it. I'm going to say NXT was better than SmackDown. And I'm going to pretty much roast SmackDown if it's that bad. This is going to be epic. But that's just me. Peace.